Standing alone in the Indian Ocean for centuries, the Cocos Keeling Islands remained almost entirely untouched by the outside world. But things are changing. There's a problem in paradise. It's depressing, it's really depressing. It's basically everywhere. It just keeps coming. We can clean the beach one day and it's back again. It's not from the waste that we've produced. This tiny Australian territory is on the receiving end of a global tide of plastic pollution. A community of a few hundred dealing with the washed up waste produced by millions, thousands of miles away. And according to the latest scientific research, the plastic problem could be far bigger than previously thought. What you see is only the tip of the iceberg. This is the next climate change and nobody's thinking that it's going to be as bad as it is. It's the last place you would associate with pollution. The crystal clear waters of the Cocos Keeling Islands are teeming with marine life. And for around 600 people, it's a tranquil home. About a third of the residents have moved here from the Australian mainland, but the majority are local Cocos Malay, descendants of the labourers brought here when the islands were first settled in the 19th century. But in a place where time sometimes seems to stand still, the next generation are facing something new. Denzel has been surfing these waters for years. At 14, he's already at one with the awesome, natural power of the ocean. But he's troubled too at the constant flow of man-made waste it's carrying to his home. If you're paddling out, you'll see some plastic bags here and there. You just grab them and throw them back onto the shore. We all want the turtles eating it. It's basically everywhere. It just keeps coming. I'm not really sure there's a lot we can do because it's more um, the like rubbish from other countries like Malaysia and Indo that we get so we can like clean up and everything but then they'll just keep hammering us putting more onto our island. Despite their isolation, the islands are in the convergence path of a number of major ocean systems. These three currents feed into the South Equatorial Current. Seen like this, it's clear why the island shores are particularly prone to the floating plastic from right across the region. Australian Navy vessels patrol the coast on the lookout for refugee boats that occasionally approach. But when it comes to ocean plastics, there's no such thing as borders. From a distance, the shorelines seem pristine, but appearances can be deceiving. Focus in, and it's a completely different story. Piles of plastic are washing up everywhere. On the sand, in the rocks, even in the vegetation going back from the beach. This island is completely uninhabited. The only footprints in the sand are those of our team. It should be an untouched tropical gem. And yet the waste of people thousands of miles away has very much left its mark here. Right the way along the shoreline, you see plastic debris like bottles, 
uh, rubber flip-flops, plates and other things. And what you have to understand is that these remote islands in the middle of the deep oceans act almost like litter traps. This is, if you like, a sample of the amount of plastic waste that is bobbing around and still floating out in the deep ocean. To get a real sense of the global nature of the waste that finds its way to these shores, you only need to look at the origins of the things that wash up here. Aside from the local red hermit crabs, one of the most common sights on any of these beaches are plastic bottles. This one, judging by the script, has come from Thailand. There are loads from Indonesia. These are both uh, marked as being made in Jakarta, both of these. But they come from even further afield as well. And this one says it was packed in the Maldives. Now, just think how far that has traveled through the ocean. This is probably quite an old bottle, because if you look, I can almost break it apart with my hand. It's got, become so brittle, I couldn't do that with the other ones. And this one, I think, is even more the case. I suspect this is part of a bottle from China. And as you can see, it's actually falling apart in my hands. With many residents relying on tourism for a living, you might expect them to try and hide the issue, but not here. Kylie runs regular canoe tours around the most spectacular parts of the island. We joined her as she took a group out into the turquoise waters of the atoll. But as part of these excursions, she makes a point of showing the tourists the plastic waste as well. It's depressing, it's really depressing. And sometimes we come out here and there's lots of rubbish like this, and then there's other times you come out here and there's not so much rubbish. But you know if it's not here, it's actually floating around out there. So What's the main reaction you get when you bring tourists here? Often people are horrified. Um, and surprised because, again, you know, if they're living in suburbia, they're not aware of um, really what's going on. Because um, they buy something from the shop, they put their waste in the garbage, somebody comes along and collects the garbage, so they're not actually seeing what is happening as a result of um, all the particularly single-use plastics. So we're going to come with 25 or 30 people in a heap of bags. That'll make a difference. Often those on the tour are moved to start somewhere. picking things up straight away. If that little bit there stops going in a fish and it lives, then that's a good thing. <laughs> anyway, we'll do what we can. But with each tide, more plastic is brought to the shore. The problem on the islands has prompted a coalition of Australian environmental groups to take action. With volunteers flying in from across the country. Lots of Lego little plastic toys. Over a few days, they covered around two miles of coastline, picking up a total of just over two tonnes of waste. Good. Yeah. This effort is about much more than a clean-up. The items are categorised and logged, with barcodes and manufacturer labels all entered into the Australian Marine Debris Database. And one spirit. Which now holds more than 7.5 million entries. What we try and do is identify how the item actually ended up in the environment. And in some cases, it's from the person that designed it or used it or made it. In other, in other cases, it's a, a consumer littering issue. So once you understand that release, then you have the opportunity to find out what needs to change to prevent that. This effort doesn't just help identify the sources of pollution, it also provides the backbone of data about the quantity of waste being washed up. Including some startling revelations, like the fact three quarters of all the marine debris found on Australia's coastlines is plastic. But what if it turned out that information only scratched the surface? What you see is only the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Jennifer Lavers has dedicated her life to studying ocean plastics. She's convinced the scale of the problem has been vastly underestimated. The reality of the plastic situation is that we are only skimming the surface. What is really, truly out there, we don't have a 
the complete picture. There are big gaps in our understanding. These remote shores may offer a chance to rectify that. Waste washing up here is far more easily measured than what's in the sea. And given almost all of it comes from somewhere else, it is in effect a barometer for how much could be in the ocean. Marking out specific sample areas, Dr. Lavers and her team carry out thorough surveys along tide lines and back into the vegetation. The aim to get a more realistic picture of the amount of plastic present. Look at that under there. Are you going to take a sample of those? That's terrifying. Underneath the vegetation, there's just layers more plastic. Some of it quite big. Look, here's another bottle. Yep. Polystyrene. Part of a shoe. Looks like this might be part of a clothes peg. After repeated comparative testing, Dr. Lavers has found that on average, a typical volunteer beach cleanup misses up to 80% of the plastic pieces that are actually on the beach surface. Bottle. To put this to the test, I was asked to pick up as much plastic as I could in one of the research team's sample areas. When the team went back through the area, the theory was proved correct. On average, a typical beach cleanup only captures around 20, perhaps 25% of the rubbish that's present on the beach. We found some quite large items like baby formula scoops, some of our top offenders like bits of bag fragments, plastic bag, some fishing rope and netting uh, and various fragments and, and larger items. I was looking quite carefully. I mean, I would say just roughly that that's almost the same amount again that I picked up when I went through. Yes. And it's not even that small, some of this stuff, is it? These, the, the, the toothpaste tops. It turned out I found just a quarter of the 300 items that were actually on the surface of that small area. A recent study claimed there were 124 billion pieces of visible plastic washed up on Australia's coastlines alone. But if that number is off by up to 80%, the true figure could be closer to 600 billion pieces of plastic. An underestimate with alarming implications for how much more could be in our oceans. For centuries, the Cocos Keeling Islands were untouched by the outside world. But things are changing. They're being battered by a tide of global plastic pollution not of their making. How does a community like this deal with rubbish from Sri Lanka, Maldives, from Indonesia, from China? And as new research indicates, the amount of plastic on shore could be underestimated by up to 80%. We hear why immediate action is vital. The rate which this is all changing is just so fast. We don't have that time. We just simply don't. Scientists believe these remote islands in the Indian Ocean could be key to understanding the seriousness of the global plastics problem. With almost all the waste here coming from somewhere else, what's washed up is a good indication of what's out there. And if the amount of waste on the beaches has been underestimated, in all likelihood, the amount in the ocean has too. For those who live on the islands, it's a problem that is becoming increasingly hard to ignore community is starting to sit up and take note. On a humid spring evening, many gathered for an open-air screening of a film about the impact of ocean plastic. Absolutely no doubt that this bird died Start as a result of that plastic. That is literally a gut full of plastic. The residents here are keen to know more about a global problem that feels so close to home. It looks like a lift bag. This increased awareness has led to a new consideration about the amount of waste the islanders produce themselves.
Recent local authority investments like this bottle pulverizer have started to make a difference. Glass powder produced from bottles and jars is now being reused on the island for concreting and hardcore for road construction. We never used to have a solution, so it just used to get dumped, left out in the open, the creepers would start growing over it, um, and it was just getting bigger and bigger. So now we're, we're slowly tackling the problem, turning that into this. But other recycling options here are limited. Waste is either too expensive to ship, or there are quarantine issues that mean it would not be accepted on the mainland. And so even the trash created by a tiny community like this can quickly accumulate. And that's before they even begin to deal with the foreign waste that's washing up. It's a huge problem and, and we're, we're a tiny little island in the middle of nowhere um, that uh, we just can't, we can't tackle that ourselves. Some people come, they participate in a beach cleanup, they feel good, but we know it's going to come back the next day. It's, it's fixing that, that ongoing problem as well is what we need. In many ways, the waste challenge faced by this island is quite unique. It's a tiny population in a very remote location with limited space and resource to deal with the issue. And yet, in other ways, it's a kind of microcosm of the global dilemma because you can recycle some things, you can shift things around to different locations at great expense. But in the end, a lot is either dumped, buried or just burnt. And so whether it's here or anywhere else, the solution can only be to try and reduce the amount of waste we're creating in the first place. And that responsibility does not fall entirely to the consumer. Polluting producers really love the idea of consumer responsibility and consumer choice because it alleviates them of any responsibility for their design choices. These are products that just should not exist. On beaches around the world, these items turn up in huge numbers again and again. The film top, right? They may be sold as disposable, but they don't simply disappear. Things like lighters and toothbrushes that are really, really solid, heavy plastic, they're perfectly suited for long journeys at sea. So you can drop one of these overboard in, in the UK and something like this has the potential to survive a journey to the other side of the world. Before these uh, disposable lighters came along, you pretty much had a lighter for life. You refilled it, you reused it, and so changing the way these items are made could have a major impact. A design-based solution to turning off that tap is important and we need the industry leaders, we need the Coca-Colas, the Unilevers, the Colgates, we need Dow Packaging, all of these big names to just say, OK, we are going to provide pollution-free packaging and products, simple as that. And they can do it. Pollution is a design choice. But those everyday items make up only a portion of the plastic washed up by the tides. What they will ultimately become is often missed. This is the first microplastic transect that we did yesterday from the high accumulation zone. These tiny fragments almost always go unaccounted for in estimates of plastic pollution. And yet their presence is a critical part of understanding the scale of the problem. This break up into thousands, millions of pieces can really happen at quite a rapid rate. When you add in uh, exposure to UV, that really causes the plastic to become quite brittle and this just accelerates. As well as the chemicals used to make them, the fragments absorb additional toxins from the sea itself, making them a major threat to marine life and other animals further down the food chain. If a fish comes along, or a bird, or a turtle, really any wild animal comes and consumes something like this, it looks a lot like a fish egg, and it's toxic, it's just absolutely laden with chemicals on the surface. Those chemicals are now readily available to be uh, absorbed into that animal's tissues, and that's where all of the concern really lies. The aim of this research is to broaden the scope of the Australian Marine Debris Database adding plastic fragments to the information already logged, providing even more hard data to pressure those in political power to take action. How does a community like this deal with rubbish from Sri Lanka, from Maldives, from Indonesia, from China? 
it's a, it's a big problem. We also need the government to start accepting how big a problem marine debris is going to be in the future. This is the next climate change and nobody's thinking that it's going to be as bad as it is. If we start looking at communities like the islands here that rely so heavily on seafood and that's contaminated by plastics and chemicals that are in the ocean, this is going to be not, a, not an issue about saving turtles. This is going to be a human health issue and that will be a game changer for, this, um, for solving this issue as well. These islands are far removed from the locations normally associated with plastic pollution. There are no beachfront slums here, no storm drains or plastic choked urban rivers funneling discarded waste to the coast. Compared to all that, this place feels like a different world. But the reality is, it's not. Even in this picture postcard scene, the sand is filled with millions of fragments of plastic. And each tide brings in more and more. Marine plastic pollution should be up there in the same space, given the same amount of funding and consideration and recognition as the other major environmental issues that we face right now. Really, we need to, we need to move fast. We need to not necessarily always wait for more science and more data to make these critical decisions. We have enough now to indicate that the problem is significant and that it's rapidly increasing. And that if we wait for more data to come in and for confirmation of, of perhaps a little bit of a hunch here and a bit of a hunch there, the, the rate at which this is all changing is just so fast. We don't have that time. We just simply don't. Paradise is a big title to live up to. But the Cocos Keeling Islands come as close as anywhere on earth to deserving it. For so long, this place was entirely untouched by man. And yet, in just a few decades, its ecology and the future health of its wildlife and residents have all been put at risk as a direct result of our global plastic addiction. If there's a problem in paradise, there's a problem everywhere.